Okay, so class ended hopefully with you getting to the point where we introduced the phase change diagram, which looks like um, kind of that series of slopes and plateaus. And the idea is that's kind of a very conceptual notion of energy and phase changes. What we're going to do now is make it a little more um, quantitative. We're going to stick some numbers on this. So the first thing to do is we need to define some vocabularies. We have three terms, the molar heat of fusion, molar heat of vaporization, and something called the specific heat. OK, so pencils ready. Here we go. The molar heat of fusion is the heat energy required to change one mole of anything, of any s substance, from solid to liquid. And what you'll find here is that when we're talking about this going back and forth, we're really talking about the process of going from solid to liquid or from liquid to solid. And what you'll find is that the molar heat of fusion going one way will be positive, and then for the reverse process, the number would just be negative. So in this case, we're talking about going from solid to li the liquid to solid, solid to liquid phase. So we're really talking about kind of this, this plateau if we were looking at our at our graph like that. The second one, molar heat of vaporization, the, the definition is almost identical to the molar heat of fusion. We're talking about the heat energy. And I'm just going to put dot, dot, dot. It's the same as what it is up here, except to change one mole of anything from, again, it's vaporization. So we're talking about from a liquid to a gas. And like before, you'll be given the, the heat, and usually it's going from liquid to gas. If you want to know what it is going the other way, you would just reverse the sign. But usually we'll be talking about heating things up. So we're thinking about going from liquid to gas. OK, the final term is something called specific heat. You may or may not have covered this in physics last year, but it's the amount of heat the amount of heat energy to raise the temperature, the amount of heat energy to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So the amount of heat energy to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. And what that means is that the easier it is to change the temperature of a substance, the lower its specific heat. So things like metals, um, you know, aluminum pans and copper bottomed cookware and things like that, they have a really low specific heat because it's really easy to heat those things up and cool them off. On the other end, there are things like water and water has a really high specific heat. It takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of water. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about specific heat. OK, on to the next part. Hopefully, again, this picture is starting to seem very, very happy and familiar. What we're going to do is apply these vocabulary terms to this picture and specifically introduce some equations and when to use them. So there are two situations that you're going to be facing in these calculations. The first one, and I'll kind of do one on top of the picture and one on the bottom. The first situation is raising, or I should say changing, the temperature, not the phase. So in other words, we're heating or cooling water, we're heating or cooling a gas, we're heating and cooling a solid, but we're not changing from liquid to solid or solid to liquid. So that's kind of situation one, changing the temperature, not the phase. On the other end, on the bottom here, we'll look at changing the phase, but not the temperature. Okay.
So up on top, let's start with there. Changing the temperature, but not the phase. The equation, and again, depending on, um, you may or may not have had this equation cross your path before. Our equation is the energy, usually abbreviated E, or sometimes you'll see it referred to as heat, equals, and then three things multiplied together. The specific heat of a substance, which you'll sometimes see abbreviated as um, C or S. I don't know why. I don't know why we have two options, but we're going to refer to it as C. Times the mass of the substance. In other words, how much you have, and we'll refer to that as M. Times the change in temperature. Delta T. So what you're talking about then is the energy it takes to change something is dependent on three factors. How big it is. It takes more energy right, to change the heat of a swimming pool than it does to change the heat of a cup of water. How much you want to change it. Are you changing it by a small amount or are you trying to change it by a really large um, temperature difference? And then the specific heat. How much does it take for this specific substance to change temperature? This equation gets applied anywhere we're changing the temperature, but not the phase. So we're going to be talking about that here, when we're heating things here, when we're heating things here, when we're heating things here. I call this um, the slope equation, not because it's y equals mx plus b, but because this is the equation that we use when we're on the slope of this phase change, not when we're on the plateau. So again, you'll see that abbreviated E equals C M delta T. And very often, you'll be solving algebraically. We'll give you maybe three of these four variables. You got one, two, three, four variables. We'll give you three of them and ask you to solve for the fourth one. OK, so let's bop down then to when we're changing phase but not changing temperature. So now I call these, this is the plateau. Plateau equation. So these are the equations that we're going to use on the flat parts of the graph. Okay, so and then we're bringing in some of that vocabulary again. So when we're changing phases, we're going to look at going from solid to liquid, and then we're going to look at going from liquid to gas back and forth, back and forth. So for the solid to liquid part, the energy is equal to the moles of a substance, not mass, but moles. The moles of a substance, which is conveniently abbreviated M-O-L, they save you so much time taking off the E and the S, times the molar heat of fusion times the molar heat of fusion. And if we click back over to that previous page, we'll see that the molar heat of fusion is what we're thinking about when we're going from a solid to a liquid. So that makes sense that this is where that phrase would show up. And because it's molar heat, that's one of the reasons that we need to be in moles of a substance rather than in grams. Okay, so very often you'll see this measured in kilojoules or joules. I've seen it can, it can go either way, but be prepared that you'll be working in kilojoules. Okay, so for this one, so that's the solid to liquid. The liquid to gas is going to look almost identical. So we have our energy equals moles of a substance, which will probably mean that you might be doing a t-chart. If you're given grams, that's a t-chart conversion to get into moles. And then instead of the molar heat of fusion, we're going to be looking at the molar heat of vaporization. And again, probably measured in kilojoules. You might also see it in joules, but that's usually what you'll see. So again, I mentioned that this is the plateau equation. So that's where they're going to show up. This one here, you're going to see in the solid to liquid equation. E equals 
moles times the molar heat of fusion. And my writing is getting super teeny, I apologize. Molar heat of fusion. Right here, energy equals moles times the molar heat of vaporization. So again, you'll be given all of these numbers. Usually there are, in these cases, three values in each equation, like one, two, three, and then one, two, three. Very often asked, you'll be given two and then asked to solve for the third one. Okay, so let's actually get these in action. So please fire up your calculator if you have not already done so. And let's take a look at how we would actually see this in action. These equations can seem a little overwhelming at first only because a lot of numbers are thrown at you all at once. The important thing to kind of get your head on straight is to think about where you're moving on that phase change diagram. And I'll show you what I mean by that here in just a moment. So here we are. Let's look at example number one. Water's boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius, and here's the heat of vaporization. Notice we're in kilojoules, so that's kind of just what we expected. And here's the specific heat of water. I say you have 85 grams of water at a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. How much energy would be required to heat the water to its boiling point? Okay, so here's what I mean by looking at and thinking about the phase change diagram to kind of get your head on straight. So let's, I'm just kind of going to sketch that phase change diagram picture. And we're going to use that to help us know which equations to use. So if you remember, kind of this is going solid to liquid. This is going liquid to gas. And we need to think about where we're moving on this graph in order to know what equations to use. So I'm told I have 85 grams of water. OK, so I'm, I know I'm in the water portion, which is going to be right here. This is the liquid portion at 15 degrees Celsius. So I'm just eyeballing this roughly, but just to get an idea of what we're doing. Um, how much energy will be required to heat the water to its boiling point? OK, well, I'm told the boiling point is right up there. So I'm going up here. The boiling point is where we transition from liquid to gas. I'm on the slope, which means I'm going to use the slope equation. And if we click back over here, that slope equation, there it is right there. E equals CM delta T. We'll just write it up here to jog our memory. And then the next thing, again, all you said about doing is tossing in the variables that you need and solving for what you need to solve for. The question is asking for energy. We'll be solving for E. So here we go. E equals the specific heat. I know that because I'm told that right up there. So I have 4.186. And this fabulous unit is joules per gram degrees Celsius. It's the energy in joules required to heat one gram one degree Celsius. So that's why there's that kind of funky unit in there. Times the mass of water. Okay, so we're told we have 85.0 grams times delta T or our change in temperature. So that's going to be 100.0 minus 15.0 Celsius. And it's just a matter of kind of plugging the numbers through and seeing what you get. So when you multiply all those out, go ahead, do that now. See if you get the same answer as me. We do 4.186 times 85 times 100 minus 15, taking that difference. And we get, let's see. Three, zero. Now, this is what my calculator spit out, right? But we're going to make sure that we take significant figures. Okay, so this is the number. And somebody always asks the great question, well, what are the units? And the nice part is if you look back up in your equation, you can cancel things out. And that'll give you a big hint as to what your units should be. Um, for example, grams is here in the denominator of this equation. And it appears up here. So grams cancels out one in the denominator and then one kind of in the numerator. Same thing with degrees Celsius. It's up here and down here. So the only thing that I should have left is joules. OK, so then to do a little converting, I need to round to get my correct sig figs. So looking in at all these numbers, I can have three significant figures in my final answer. 
So that means that I'm going to round to 3020 joules. No decimal point. If I put a decimal point on it, then that would give me five sig figs. So 30200 joules has three significant figures. If the answer asked for it in kilojoules, I would just divide by a thousand and I would get 30.2 kilojoules. Okay, next part. Once the water is at its boiling point, how much energy would be, would be required to evaporate all of it? So this is a case where I'm not thinking about changing the temperature anymore. That tells me right there I'm changing phase. So to go back up to our diagram, I'm at this part right here. I'm at a plateau problem. So let's back up here really quick. Our plateau problems Here's where we're looking. It's the moles times the molar heat of vaporization. So let's take a look at what that might look like. Energy, we need the number of moles times the molar heat of vaporization. So again, let's figure out what that would be. Here we have energy equals, and now moles, I need to figure that out. I'm given grams of water, which means I need a T-chart. 85.0 grams, and I'm converting grams of water into moles of water. And then H2O, it's going to be 18.016 grams. Plug that through, and again, make sure you calculate for sig figs, 85.0 divided by 18.016. 4.7 two moles. I'm going to plug that back into my original equation. And the molar heat of vaporization, look back up on the top here, that's given to us. So that's pretty handy. So all, again, all you're doing is just plugging that in. 40.6 kilojoules per mole. And again, notice what units cancel out and what we're left with. Here, moles shows up here and here. So the only unit we're left with is kilojoules. Energy should always be factored in as joules or kilojoules. If you get something other than that, so something has gone terribly wrong. Okay, so 4.72 times 40.6. My calculator spits out. 191.632, but I'm going to round for sig figs. I can keep three, which means my final answer is going to be 192 kilojoules. Okay, so with that, there's one more to try. Kind of the final part of your homework is trying the next problem on your own, and then um, that will be checked as soon as you come to class next time. All right.